Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Holger. And also a warm, warm welcome from me to everyone attending this. It's, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I was a bit sad uh, when, when the news came that we wouldn't do this in person. I really enjoy meeting all the, like all the, all the people in the community coming together. But um, yeah, I think, I think this is also, um, has also some, some very interesting aspects to it, especially being, being open to so many more people and so on. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm excited to try to try this out for our, for our first um, virtual thing forward. So um, I'll, be, I'll be speaking a bit about, um, about uh, stateful functions um, the, the headline of the talk is where, where stream processing meets serverless applications. But as usual, I, I would try to, to do a bit of a, a recap of what's been going on in Apache Flink um, over, the, over the last months, what, what happened in the last release, what's, what the, is the community currently working on, to give you a bit of an, a bit of an idea um, about where, you know, what's happening in the project and, and where it's moving. So, um, a, a disclaimer right at the at the beginning. So um, Holger mentioned it before. The like the Flink community has has become an a, a crazy active community. Um, it's 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 frequently in the in the absolute top three projects in in, in Apache in terms of like mailing list activity, commit activity, um, issue discussion activity, and so on. So there's there's so many things happening at the same time that it's impossible to do, you know, to do justice to, to all these threads. So I'm, I'm mentioning some of them here. Um, if I'm not mentioning anything, um, this is not that this is not an interesting thread or anything. It's just, you know, it's just impossible to, to kind of give a, give a really um, encompassing overview in such a, in such a talk. What maybe is worth um, noticing in, in the, in the trends that are happening in the Flink community right now is that, Whereas the, um, I would say the, the previous year and the previous releases, um, there was a lot of effort in, in trying to, um, in trying to improve the state of, um, you know, batch processing on top of stream processing, because there was clearly, there were qu clearly quite a few, um, you know, like still, still weaknesses, uncovered, um, features in Flink and over the releases 1.8, and so on, Flink has made actually pretty big progress there. I think what you can see in 2020 is that the focus is, is almost shifting a little bit um, back to to stream processing, or at least to the point where where, where the streaming and batch use cases really really start to meet. So let me let me just take a, a look at a few of the use cases um, that that have a lot of activity at the moment. So the first one I would I would like to um, to point out is is the whole ecosystem around um, SQL. And SQL meaning both both streaming SQL, batch SQL, um, the interoperability with change logs and change data capture that is coming up, producing materialized views over data streams. Um, we we actually saw that um, that Flink had a had a pretty powerful engine for um, for streaming SQL. Um, definitely after you know after the the Blink query processor has been merged. Um, during the last year, the the core SQL engine has actually been an, an extremely an extremely powerful one. I would I'd actually even say I'm not aware of any project where the where the core SQL query processor um, is can can cover as much um, streaming functionality with also with comparable performance. Um, what is what is um, a focus in the last releases is um, a lot of connectivity with the outside world. So Flink 110 introducing lots of catalog and enhancements to DDL and Flink 111 adding support um, for, for sources that present um, change logs. So not just you know, records coming in being conceptually appended to the dynamic tables, but also representing deletes, updates, um, other types of modifications. If you want to learn more about this, there are two talks, um, one coming up later today, one coming up tomorrow, um, sorry, on Friday, that will give you really a deep dive into what's happening there. But I'd, I'd like to show you at least a, a small teaser of what you can actually do in the, in the latest version of, of, um, of Apache Flink. Um, it's using a very down-to-earth way to present this, the, um, the SQL client that comes with the project, but it should give you um, an interesting impression. And let's see how well the, the video integration here works. All right, so this is what it looks these days to actually use SQL from the from the um, client in Flink. 
we're actually activating a catalog here, a Hive catalog um, that Flink has been integrated with, um, exploring the tables that are stored in the catalog, describing the schema of some of the tables, and then issuing a first query. This is a streaming query going against a, a bounded table. So eventually, um, the system will have given us all of the results. A SQL client gives us a paginated view here to, to explore the results if we want to scroll back and forth. Um, let's do something a little more interesting. Let's define a new source, a new source that goes against um, Kafka. So it's a streaming table that changes over time. So we're defining the schema, some of the connector properties, and then we're issuing the exact same query again. And we're seeing this now as a, as a streaming query. So um, bit by bit, you know, new rows come in as, as new events show up in Kafka. Now what we're doing is we're actually creating a new table, um, a new empty table that is, um, that is stored in a file system here in S3 um, that, you know, just for simplicity stores CSV data. So this is, um, this is basically a new table that we now registered in the catalog. And we can now actually send a, set a query that inserts from, from the table that was defined over Kafka into that table that we just defined in, um, in the file system. And because this is a query that doesn't actually, it's not interactive in the sense that we're, we're just issuing the query and we're asking the, the SQL client to show us the result, but we're, we're really sending off a query that says data from here insert into that. So it's, it's kind of a self-contained query that the, that the client sends off and then let's go. So um, in order to see what it's doing, we're actually looking into the Flink UI. It's a very simple query. It's just an insert into select star. So there's really no shuffle, no nothing. So it's all one task. We've now canceled the query, so some of the data has been actually inserted into the table. Um, and now we can actually take this new table also as the source of further queries and define a, a window inquiry over the table into which we just inserted some data from Kafka. Yeah, so that, that's kind of a, a small teaser of, um, of what you can do with the, with the SQL integration these days. Um, the, the talks that um, I mentioned here on the right side, they give you a bit of a of a, um, yeah, a deeper, uh, a deeper dive into what you can do these days. Another pretty big thing that the community has been working on in the last releases is actually support for Python. And um, this is a picture I took from the blog post at the at the bottom. Um, the, the, high, uh, the Python features have actually developed quite um, quite impressively over the last releases. So in 1.9, it started out with a simple support for the table API in Python. In 1.10, it, it added user-defined functions, um, including you know, management for, for Python dependencies, other libraries you depend on. And 1.11 is actually a pretty big roadmap for, for Python as well, including um, better integration with observability tools, um, the Flink metric system, and so on, and integration with popular libraries like Pandas. So, if you're interested in, in looking at, um, at Python a bit more, there's also a deep dive talk on, on Friday that looks at, at Python and um, actually Python together with, with notebooks. So for, um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty exciting new feature where you can see a lot of common data science tools um, being available to, to Flink users now. Um, aside from from let's say new new features in terms of um, in terms of new APIs like Python or um, like new integrations like like Hive and SQL, there's also a lot of operational work that's still that's still happening. That's that's always an ongoing thing, right? It's a it's a distributed system system. There's there's always things you can you can make easier. And again, there's there's a lot of threads going on. Um, I cannot really dive very deep into into all of them. So I'd, I'd just like to mention um, mention some of them and maybe maybe just pick two as an example to um, to show the kind of work that the, that the community is doing there right now. The first one I would like to take a look at is actually um, memory management because as as dry and as boring as it sounds, it's actually it's actually quite quite an essential thing and it's it's very often um, like a core core factor in whether your life and operating the system is actually it's actually a Fun, fun or not. So, um, being being a Java system, um, Flink runs on the JVM. So everything starts with the JVM heap. But 
pretty much since the early days, Flink has not just looked at the at the JVM heap, but also dedicated certain um, portions of the memory explicitly to managing um, managing data and state. And that means for batch algorithms, for example, the the hash tables for joins and for um, for streaming algorithms, it means you know keeping keeping the state that gets snapshotted as part of checkpoints. Um, network actually, if you want high performance um, shuffling across uh, high parallelism, network needs a, a not trivial amount of memory as well to to always make this highly efficient. So this was pretty much your memory model that you got in in versions of Flink up to 1.9. There were there were two shortcomings that I think were pretty. That, that could come annoying to users. The first one being that there's actually another component, a pretty significant one that Flink didn't manage explicitly, and that was all the overhead that the JVM adds, um, including things like you know the meta space, the um, the compile cache, the th uh, thread stack space, and so on. And for especially if you run Flink in a containerized environment, be that on be that on like a proper C group container isolation, like um, like Docker Kubernetes. But also in other systems like Yarn, where you had you had memory monitoring of the processes, this could become quite, um, quite quite a significant part in tuning this. And in in Flink 110, this is actually taken care of for you, so making the making the use in container environments um, much easier. The second part that's actually pretty big and was not not a trivial piece of work is um, the integration of of RocksDB into Flink's memory management. So um, when you're selecting RocksDB as the state backend, there's no need now to, to explicitly configure RocksDB anymore to try and you know configure caches and write buffers and so that they're that they're large enough for good performance, but also small enough so they don't exceed um, the amount of memory and and get your processes killed. So with 110, this is all actually taken care of automatically. So um, this should give you really a really nice out of the box experience, um, even when you know combining Flink with RocksDB. Another part that I would quickly um, like to talk about is underlined checkpoints and, and fault tolerance. So what does, what does it actually mean? What is underlined checkpoints? Um, so checkpoints is one of the, let, I would say, oldest and core concepts of Flink, right? As long as Flink has been doing stream processing, there have been checkpoints. It's kind of been the defining feature of Flink when it entered the stream processing space. There's a lot of good things about um, checkpoints, but one of the, one of the very core properties in the checkpointing algorithm is, is, is checkpoint barriers that define what data is before and after a checkpoint. They flow strictly in order with events. And, and in most cases, that's a really good idea because it gives you this nice separation of you know, pre-checkpoint epoch and post-checkpoint epoch. There's one thing, though, when it, when it can become an issue, and that is under back pressure. And again, back pressure is, is in itself actually a good thing. It's, it's something that can help make the system you know, well behaved, can help um, make different parts of the system not drift apart from each other if one part is actually slower than the other. For example, if you have, um, yeah, if you have an operation that is, that's becoming a bottleneck, even if not a permanent but a bottleneck, but just a temporary bottleneck. So under, under back pressure, um, the events are back pressured, and so are the checkpoint barriers. And it can lead to situations where checkpoints under back pressure take a very long time. And that that's not really a desirable property because it it makes checkpoints less predictable. And for you know for operational simplicity and stability, you really want checkpoints to actually behave in a very predictable way. Now the solution to that is actually in like a reworking extension of the checkpoint algorithm where we're, um, where we're allowing barriers to overtake checkpoints, meaning we can actually get checkpoints through under back pressure. In, in the general case, even if the system isn't a complete, if you wish, the, the data flow is completely standing still, barriers can still overtake events um, and trigger checkpoints. Now there's of course some accounting for the events you overtake that you have to do. Um, and we've come to call this a process unaligned checkpoints because it it kind of circumvents the alignment phase of checkpoints. There's some um, I think we've mentioned this feature quite a while ago. It's been a very um, I would say it's been a while since we um, started to work on this because it's a very delicate change to the to the core checkpointing algorithm. But it's actually has made some really nice progress and it's showing us some really um, some really cool initial results. So. We're actually um, we're actually quite excited to um, to start releasing this to the um, to the public. And there's there's a deep dive talk that actually mentions more 
of the details of the um, of this. And and not only not only the underlying checkpoints, but it goes kind of into opening up um, a bigger thread of work um, in rethinking the fault tolerance of Apache Flink. So I think for the like for the first time since the project started, we're actually um, looking at at changing the really the core um, checkpointing mechanism that's kind of been the constant foundation of, of Flink. All right. So um, with this as like a, maybe a think of it as a teaser for some of the threats um, that are going on. I'd, I'd like to dive into the into the main topic for um, for this talk, um, looking at at stateful functions 2.0. Just to um, to help with a with a quick recap, what what is stateful functions about and and what is it for? So it's it's the latest addition to to Flink, and it's um, you can think of it not as an idea to replace the data stream API or the table API, but it's really um, it's really meant to target a different set of use cases that um, I think are actually where stream processing is a good is a good match for them, but where the current APIs and um, their philosophy is not always is not always the um, the perfect match. So it's this area of event driven applications as as a third area next to the other two areas that Flink has been doing: stateful stream processing and streaming analytics. Um, the the core idea of stateful functions, um, or let's say of the stateful functions API, is this idea of of building building applications not as um, as streaming data flows, but but build them out of you know, individual individual functions that own local state and that message each other. It it's in some sense almost like um, a bit like actor programming, but um, with some some very specific properties like um, statefulness, um, exactly once messaging in a, in a very similar way as you're used to it um, from stream processing, but with the with the flexibility of of arbitrary messaging that um, you know that you that you get from um, from actor systems. So these these functions would have typically certain types. Um, for example, let's, let's let's take the the hello world of these distributed applications, a, a shopping cart. Um, for users and some inventory management. So these functions would have different types like uh, cart type and inventory type, a user type, and then certain certain instances like, um, um, I don't know, uh, black socks or so, or user Kim. And those would be the, the instances of these functions that manage the state for this specific line item or the specific user. Um, Maybe to give you a bit of background, what what does stateful functions really do differently, for example, than the than the stream processing APIs that Flink has? There's there's a few a few core differences. Um, the first one being that where stream processing comes with a um, with a predefined data flow of um, of data going through the system, you know, one operator emitting strictly to the next operator. Um, stateful functions really follows a more dynamic messaging model. So you don't you don't define it upfront, but at any point in time, a function can can decide whom to message, and that that also makes it interestingly like very dynamically extensible. You know, as you add new functions, you can start um, to to talk back and forth with existing functions without actually having to to change or rethink the program or the wiring or anything. Um, the the second part is that stream processing. Um, strictly follows um, directed acyclic graphs. Not only in Flink, I think that's kind of it's it's a common thing in all in all stream processors that um, I'm aware of. And there's there's good reasons for that because um, the nature of a directed acyclic graph is actually um, it's actually important if you want like simple simple behavior of um, event time and watermarks. You you need a very strict predecessor um, successor relationship for that. Um, in contrast to that, um, stateful functions actually gives you the ability to do um, both cyclic and acyclic messaging. It, it doesn't matter. So in, in some sense, it's it's like a stream processor where you can send messages also sideways or or backwards and so on, which which gives you a lot more flexibility. But um, yeah, it's also um, it's it's also a very different paradigm to think than than stream processing um, as you know as encompassed by the data stream API. The third difference is where um, where the stream processing APIs kind of think in 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 fixed and reserved resources, 
the um, stateful functions don't don't really try to um, try to assume that that you know like a certain function type occupies a, a slot in the task manager, but it it takes a much more much more dynamic resource um, philosophy where where functions are loaded loaded into an into an existing um, pool of resources and then basically multiplex and share these resources with other functions. Now, this, those were those were actually very interesting properties. I think they brought they brought a few things to the table that were that were really not not quite possible in um, both in Flink and I think in stream processing in general before. But I think to 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 fully unfold the unfold the potential of that, there were a few things that that we really wanted to have to um, to, to add to the system. And and two of the two biggest ones were we wanted this we wanted to build this as as a as a polyglot system, as a system that um, supports many languages, um, as a system that, um, yeah, is not restricted to Java and maybe some additional, um, some additional libraries. And um, the second part is we, we really wanted it to to be operable a bit more like, like I would say many users are just just used to operate um, operate applications. Where um, you can you can actually take a more stateless management approach to the um, to managing the, the computation. If you have actually your state in the database, you know, your your application containers are are fairly easy to take care of. So we're actually thinking quite hard on, on how can we get some of these properties into into stateful functions, and um, and it turns out that in the end this this needed a separation of um of computation and state while the you know the multi language support there's there's approaches to to do that um for example the way that the flink python apis do it um the way that beam does the um beam does its its portability layer and so on um where you can retain most most of the properties of stream processing and still offer you know offer um, an extensibility to many other languages, especially the the second point, like trying to operate it like a stateless application, seems like something where without without separating compute and state, um, it it wouldn't really be possible. Now this kind of stands in contrast to the whole premise, I think, of if you wish stay, uh, stream processing and stateful functions. So it, it kind of sounded like okay, um, does it mean? The whole thing is void, and we're we're basically going back to to um to a separate architecture database in the background, and um yeah, and then some some computation, be that you know simple functions or or bigger application containers in a in a stateless separate tier. Um, that wasn't that wasn't quite what um what it turned out um to become in the end, and maybe to 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 explain a bit more um what what we built and and why we we built it the way we did it um it makes sense to maybe uh take a step back and again look at um at, at stream processors and, and and databases and kind of the way that um we viewed the relationships and why actually you know stream processors are the way they are so here's a um here's a blast from the past if you wish this is a this is a slide um from a Flink Forward, I think actually even a Flink Forward in San Francisco three or four years ago. I, I don't quite remember. Quite a f quite a long time though, and um, so I'm I'm not mainly showing this to to show that our graphics looked really horrible back then. But um, I think this is the first time that that we that we kind of put this on a slide. This this notion of um, Going away from this classic tiered architecture towards a streaming architecture that does physical compute and, and state co-location, and there's there's um, there's a lot of good stuff still <laughs> about that slide. I would say it's still still correct. We're also by by far not the only ones um, that have have talked about this, um, but but it also it also raises an interesting question: um, how much of that of that state and compute co-location? Is actually necessary to to solve these these problems that um, that we actually set out to solve with the streaming architecture. And um, yeah, if we if we just take a look at the uh, at the different at the different problems that we wanted to solve back then, um, I would say these are maybe the maybe four very very prominent ones, right? Um, the whole idea of stream processing is views over over event stream kind of kind of 
ask to not have a shared database, right? Otherwise, you couldn't ad hoc just define a new view over this over this data stream. Like shared a, sh a shared database is kind of the polar opposite of this philosophy. Um, the second the second part was um, was consistency. So this the streaming architecture gives you this really nice consistency out of the box without worrying about um, about transactions that the applications have to lock certain rows and so on to make sure no other um, no other actor interferes or so. This idea of easily rolling back the stream and the views reprocessing reinstatement and so on all of these become really natural. And the fourth part um, it was it's an architecture that can really give you an extremely good performance. But if we look at what what are actually the core properties that we need for that. Um, then only only the fourth one actually really asks for for physical collocation. Um, and the other three, if you if you look at them very closely, physical collocation is definitely a good a good way to do them. But what they really ask for is that compute follows events and and state, right? Um, so computation never happens independent of a specific message and a specific piece of state. Um, in in a bit, in, in a way, you can think about it as this this core of also like the, the nature of of stateful actors, right? Compute is always tied to to a certain identity, a certain a certain key, um, key of an event, key of a, of state, and so on. And if you actually have that, then you can preserve a lot of these properties without actual actually having this strict collocation that. Um, that yeah, that that stream processors implement. Maybe maybe a way to to explain this in a in a bit easier way is, is a thought experiment um, about you know applications, state updates, and, and messaging. So um, let's let's look at at this uh, example here. We have we have a few. I don't know, let's let's think of them as as different independent services. They have they have an application um, process. They have a database that they talk to can be distributed database and distributed processes. Now we're actually, um, we're, we're calling the first, um, the first application. We're sending it a message. It does something with it. It, um, it updates the state in the database, and then it, it sends a message to another, um, another service, which in turn also does a change in the database. Now the first application actually sees now an error. A message was not successfully sent. And now we're, we're in a tricky situation, right? Because did it actually go through or not? In the general case, this is really hard to decide. If it, if it went through, did the other application actually make a change in its own state or not? And this, I think this is kind of a, like a, a core problem. And there's been a lot of work um, done in you know, creating tools and so on that help, help, help mitigate this and so on. Um, but it, it still is kind of a, a, core, a core issue in this architecture. If we now just try to flip things around and say, um, you know, we're actually not sending our messages to the application. We're actually sending them to the database, right? Let's assume the messages have also a key, primary key. They go to a database table, um, a certain row with this primary key and the message. They're taken together and they're presented to the application. The application may decide to do something with that row, update it or not. Then it goes back. That that's pretty pretty close to stream processing, right? You know, you send a message um, through a key by to to a stateful operator. You look up the state and then you apply the map function. Um, and in yeah, and then we're we're basically forwarding this to um, to another another function or so. Again, with the message goes from the state store layer to the state store layer, and we're presenting it again to the application. The message together with the state. Now we see a failure here um, on this um, on the uh, during the messaging. We're actually in a in a much in a, we're actually in a situation that's much easier to solve because um, because the failure is happening in the layer that is doing both the messaging and the state. So it's fairly I, I don't want to say completely straightforward, but the, this layer is in a very good position to actually handle. Handle this situation because it it can it can employ certain techniques that closely combine the update of state and the messaging. For example, distributed snapshots or distributed transactions. So if we actually say we're building applications not by letting the application parts talk to each other, but we're actually letting the the state layer talk to um to each other, then we've actually simplified things quite a bit. 
and in some sense, this this gives us an, an interesting way also um, to to contrast or to do compute state separation just in a, in a slightly different way compared to um, to classical two tier database um, database architectures. We we can actually still do the same thing. We just need to to retain the property that the that the stream processor is really the thing that that is that is in charge and here it's it's the stateful layer that is in charge and the application is actually the reacting part versus in the let's say in the classical architecture the database is actually the part that reacts to requests from the application um, let me skip over this for the sake of time um, so in essence, this is kind of the, the thing that we implemented in, in Stateful Functions 2.0. It's, it's an extension to, um, to, to Apache Flink that implements this basically disaggregated um, architecture um, of having you know, the, st the stateful parts um, and allows you to run the stateful and the stateless parts in, in different ways. So um, Flink and Stateful Functions are really a, a part that, that takes care of the messaging uh, takes care of the state storage, takes care of deciding when to when to invoke a function, but the functions actually get invoked through, um, for example, the services or API gateways and so on, and then they can run in a different in a different tier in the end. And um, to yeah, there's there's various ways to run this. So there's this way of um, of actually yeah really factoring the functions out and putting them in a in a completely different tier. Um, we're calling this remote functions and stateful functions. And this usually goes with um, a service like, um, yeah, a, you can think of it as a service in, in Kubernetes or a load balancer or an API gateway. Um, but you can just use the exact same mechanism if you deploy it slightly differently to implement the model that, for example, Flink Python and Beam use to, um, to run different uh, languages. Um, this this gives you closer co-location between the processes. It you know it saves you having an API gateway or a service as potentially a, a bottleneck in the invocation, but at the price of not being able to scale them independently anymore. And then finally, um, you can also still push the functions really into into the stream processor um, processes and and run them you know run them embedded. This is the way that definitely gives you the the highest performance, um, but at the cost of um, yeah, at the cost of having to to now, you know, operate again the functions and um, the stream processor um, as one as one thing. There's also a, a very nice property that this this happens to work extremely well with um, function as a service platforms. So if you if you look at patterns to build um, to build stateful um, yeah stateful application with something like AWS Lambda or any other really any other um, cloud function as a service platform, um, like a common pattern is to to say um, you know have have something like a, a message queue or um, a streaming um, a streaming bus to to supply the events have your your function as a service platform receive them. Um, and talk to talk to a managed database. Now, what the the idea of um, of stateful functions is is to um, to basically not use the the database, but instead use the stream processor and again make the make the stream processor make Flink and State from receive the events and then talk to the function as a service platform through an API gateway. And this this turns out to actually work pretty well. It it solves a bunch of um, of problems pretty much out of the box. Um, for example, consistent and scalable state. So every invocation of um, of a lambda function here always has the message and and a, and a consistent uh, consistent instance of the state directly supplied. Um, it also happens to to be quite nice when it comes to um, uh, handling handling connections and not being forced to do like complex event pooling, handling SLAs, and so on. Because interestingly, in this architecture, the um, Again, the reacting part is the one that's actually much better at reacting, right? The lambda part, the stateless functions are much better at scaling, much faster at scaling out and scaling in than the stateful layer. So actually making them the reacting part just makes makes a lot of sense, helps a lot with this um, connection pooling issues. But the second part is it because the because the flink flink and state fun processes actually not only give you state management but also messaging, you also have pretty much, um, directly consistent messaging between different different functions at your disposal. 
So um, that that's pretty much what um, yeah what what stateful functions two is um, is all about. Let's show a little demo to um, to really yeah give you a feeling of of how easy it is to operate. In the end, it, it's not going to look surprising, but it's still you know if you're coming from the background of link and stream processing, it's actually very interesting to see um, how how easy it is to operate these things. Um, the the demo setup here um, maybe as a as a quick explanation of the scenario, um, we're looking at a at a simple um, machine learning um, model evaluation scenario. We're having events from users coming in. Um, they're passing first through a set of functions that you know collect statistics on certain um, features of that uh, specific user interaction, and then they're building a feature vector based on you know current um, current properties of the event and gathered statistics. Now the the part that um, that the demo is about is actually the second function. This is a function that applies um, the machine learning uh, model, and it's it's a function implemented in Python. And we're using a we're using a setup where we actually have a bunch of uh, different models, and we're selecting between them using um, something like uh, a multi-armed bandit or K bandits. Um, so think of this as um, they're different models, and for different different users, different models work better because different users have different um, different behavior profiles, and, and the K bandits are are there to basically select um, the model that best fits the behavior profile of of that user. So what this um, this function here maintains is basically um, counts and rewards for the different arms of the the multi arm bandit um, in order to you know to help help the to help select the best model and um, through a feedback channel, those get updated. Um, the code itself is actually, um, this is a snippet of it. It's, um, I'm not going to walk through it in detail. This is only to show you that this is very, it's very, um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a lot of, of, of clumsy, um, not a lot of clumsy deployment work to make this actually work to have a remote function. Um, working with state fund on the left side is basically the, the definition of, um, of the deployment that says where, where does actually the remote function sit, what state does it have, and on the right side is basically the, the Python code that um, takes the message, turns it into a, a function invocation, and um, yeah, that handles the prediction request. So let me show this as a quick, as a quick demo. All right, so what we see here is on the left side, um, a small admin console. On the right-hand side, a dashboard that's, um, that's rendering what is our, you know, our average, or in this case, what's our, our median fraud rating that we're, that we're spitting out every second. And you can actually see it's pretty high, like more than 70% of everything we're, we're looking at is, is labeled as fraud, which, which might not actually sound right. So let's actually go to the admin interface and um, first, just this is deployed on Kubernetes. So we're first just looking at what is running there, and we can see um, one pod for the master, for the worker, and three pods um, for for the Python process that runs the machine learning models. Now we can, because they the Python workers they run as a as a separate deployment. We can we can actually just scale them independently, um, like any other stateless deployment. So as soon as we you know, scale this up and we're, we're looking at the new pods, they're stateless pods, they start pretty quick. And we can actually see on the, on the right-hand side that there's, there's really no interruption in the, in the whole model. So we basically just scaled our, um, our computation um, against Flink in a, in a pretty much in a zero downtime way. Now, in order to fix this very high um, number of frauds, let's say there is a bug in our system, we fixed it, we have actually pushed another image, and we're actually just updating this image now um, for the Python workers. Um, we're waiting here for Kubernetes to roll out this new image, and we can pretty much immediately see, okay, the new image seems to have fixed the bug. We're now getting an average of maybe 0 0.01 or 2 um, of our um, of our events labeled as, as fraudulent. So that, that definitely looks more correct. If we take a look at the different containers now, we can actually see that the, all the Flink processes, of course, have been unaffected by this. They just keep running. Um, they keep, you know, keep doing their thing, doing their checkpoints, and um, we just we just updated basically the compute part independent of the state part.
Now, you know, this is actually just pretty pretty standard um, operations on, on Kubernetes, but it's it's kind of uh, interesting to see how how you can actually get this like this very easy easy model of operating applications kind of combined with these nice properties of um, of stream processing, especially um, like this out of the box consistency and the um, yeah and this local state model. So with that, I'm actually pretty much at the end. I'd just like to take the last minute to to thank the team um, that actually worked on this. Um, it's, it was it's, it's a really cool project. It's a lot of it's a lot of fun to uh, to work on this. Um, if you found this interesting, there's going to be a deep dive talk on this in um, uh, later tomorrow. And let me skip over this slide. Um, maybe as a very last thing, this is an early project. Um, if you're interested in contributing, I think this is a really good time to um, to maybe look at this project because it's still early enough that um, there's a lot of, let's say, also low-hanging fruits to do. Maybe just very prominently um, a lot more language SDK. So we've implemented um, it's a very simple SDK to help run uh, Python code. Um, there's a lot of other languages that um, that we're we have on our roadmap to support there. So if you're interested in in helping out with this project, uh, you're very welcome. And with that, I would. I'd like to to conclude and uh, hand the mic back to um, to Holger and Constantine.